dropped out of school with nothing. I got expelled numerous times. I call it the triple threat. I had dyslexia, ADHD, and dyspraxia. When I was about 21, I began dabbling in philosophy. I go on the website for the university and it says, if you do not have the A-level, you can't apply. I'm living with a few friends before I get married and the washing machine breaks. So I go to local laundrette. I start trying the washing machines. I put the coin in, the two pound coin, and it just spills out the other side. Again, again, again. And there's like 20, you know, there's a laundrette, there's loads of them, and every single one it spills out until this final, it slots in. So we start the cycle, it's like two hours, and we sit down, and then a Buddhist monk walks in, adorned in orange robes with two baskets of orange and crimson. So I say, I look, then none of them work apart from the one I'm using. So you can either come back in a couple hours, or you can sit with us. And we start talking about different faiths and get, get onto philosophy. Two hours goes by, as you guys know, when you're talking about the good stuff. And at the end of the conversation, he says, it's interesting to meet someone your age so fascinated with the subject. Have you ever thought about studying it? I said, I have, but I I'm fiercely unqualified. He said, where did, you, where did you apply? And I tell him, and he says, well, that's interesting because I'm the head of philosophy. <laughs> Two weeks later, I get a call from UCAS and I have an unconditional offer. One of the things that's most enchanting about our world is that somehow music, art, literature, poetry, they just steal past the rational defenses, if you like. What's going on there? What is it about the way that you can tell that story through hip hop, rap, poetry that helps someone to kind of step into that reality? And welcome to today's edition of Reenchanting. I'm Justin Briley. And I'm Belle Tindall. And we are back on our rooftop perch at the top of Lambeth Palace Library to bring you another edition of Reenchanting, the show where we look at our disenchanted world and ask, can it be reenchanted with the Christian vision of reality? We have a very exciting guest joining us. We do. I'm particularly excited about this one. No, no offence to all our other guests, but I'm particularly excited about this one. We've got Joshua Luke Smith, uh, who is a poet, a songwriter, storyteller, podcaster, author. He is the founder of record label and creative community Orphan No More and the creator of Write Club. His book called Something You Once Knew and his most recent album is Liberated. So Joshua is going to help us think about how we can re-enchant our idea of creativity, the music industry and ultimately the life we have. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. So it's an honour to be here, actually. Well, well, we hear that you've been listening to the show of late, yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm, we're very glad to hear that. I've, I've loved it. I, um, I, I'll take my top Any three. Any favourite episodes? Yeah. yeah well, um, uh, Martin Shaw. Yes. Yeah. I, and I've just come across him, and yeah. a, a couple yeah. people recommended him. I heard. I love that. Brilliant. His his story of the vision. I mean, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I might pronounce her name wrong. Kate B- Bowler. Kate Bowler. Kate Bowler. Bowler. Yeah. yeah. Bowler. No, yeah. No, no, no. yeah. It's yeah gorgeous. And then um, uh, Rob- uh, Robinson. Oh my goodness. Marilyn Robinson. Marilyn Robinson. 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 Yes. yes. Yeah. So I'm a big uh, Marilyn Robinson fan, and that that was stunning. I was I was sat in a greasy spoon having a full English note taking as I listened <laughs> to that. that. That is how Marilyn <laughs> Robinson should always be listened Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Always. I loved it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, oh. a, it's an incredible well, conversation. Well, as, as you're such an expert, you'll know what our <laughs> signature question is then. Yes. Uh, which is always, as we're on the top of Lambeth Palace Library, yeah. what, what are you mm-hmm. reading lately? All right, I've come prepared. Okay. So I've, I've brought it with me. <laughs> oh, very so I'm reading, I'm reading two books. I'm reading <laughs> Stephen Fry's uh, Mythos. Ah, which mm-hmm. is his retelling of the Greek, mm. which is so good. Right. Because he's just a phenomenal storyteller. But this book is, this is my second time through it. I was reading on the train this morning, My Bright Abyss, my bright Meditations abyss. of a Modern Believer. Do you so, want to turn that around for the camera? Yeah. All there right. we go. The reason I brought it with me is, you know when someone might say, this is your favorite songwriter's favorite songwriter. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. This, this is my, or my favorite author's favorite author. <laughs> okay. but, but, but very few people have read this book ah. that I've kind of met. And it took me ages to even track it down. Christian Wyman's a poet. Um, he's a poetry editor. hmm he uh, grew up in fundamental South kind of Christianity ah, okay. and um, walked away from the faith and then met the love of his life late in his life and was then diagnosed with cancer. Um, and it caused him to reconsider his faith. But he's a poet. So I would call it a poetic apologetic. Interesting. You know, wow. so 
Can I read you an excerpt? Yeah, please. And I, and oh, I'm literally, I was literally just on the, I, I was just on the train this morning and I thought my answer to the question will be Stephen Fry's mythos, <laughs> but then I, I put this in my bag. All right, so here we go. Um, this is right from the beginning, first chapter. When I assented to the faith that was latent within me, and I phrase it carefully, deliberately, but there was no, there was no white light, no ministering or avenging angel that tore my life in two. Rather, it seemed as if the tiniest seed of belief had finally flowered in me, or more accurately, as if I had happened upon some rare flower deep in the desert and had known, though I was just then discovering it, that it had been blooming impossibly year after parched year in me, surviving all the seasons of my own belief. Mm. And wow. uh, it's, it goes on like That's that, amazing. page upon what, page. What's the subtitle of the book? Meditation of a Modern Believer. Yeah. There you go, My Bright Abyss. Yeah. I'm going to have to go and get that. Mm. I would really now. recommend yeah. it. Wow. I, you kind of read it on the edge of tears because it's, yeah. it's poetically yeah. stunning. His, his amazing. writing is amazing. But yeah, but I can't wait to get into this well, book well, next. Well, please. <laughs> yeah, this no is my next one. For, for <laughs> um, I, I think we should do this more often, Belle, have, have our guests actually bring the book that they're going to I was just and, thinking, and do a little yeah. reading from I, it. Yeah, I was just so thinking, if, I, if we start any of these without that, <laughs> I'm not doing you set it. set the bar really high I'm now. bowing out, yeah. yeah. yeah it's brilliant. Um, no, it's, it's so good to have you on the show. So thank, thanks for coming. I mean, in, in many ways, I think of you as a writer, um, an author, but perhaps in a slightly different genre, a poet, essentially mm-hmm. modern day poet. Um, when did your kind of interest in i don't know creating images mm. through words kind of begin for yourself yeah i i have quite like a distinct moment i wrote a poem at nine i was i'd come back from eight years in pakistan i'm a missionary kid mm. so it was kind of put into primary school and felt very kind of other i had no references so we came back in 98 it was the world cup 1998 and i didn't know who david beckham was <laughs> So that's a core memory in the playground. <laughs> but then I had an English teacher, Mr. Slater, and he invited us to write poems. And I wrote this poem and it was called The Loyal Friend. I can remember it verbatim, but I will not quote it because it's so odd. And, uh, but it was this kind of existential outpouring of a nine-year-old. Mm. And I came home and effectively what my parents did was tell me, you have written a poem. Uh. And uh, that was almost like my baptism into writing. And I, I have never stopped writing since that day. And I have never considered doing anything different mm, than this yeah. so it's been an odd existence um i i've stumbled through education i've struggled through education mm. i've struggled with reading i've struggled with writing i've struggled with communication i feel like this in one way is very unlikely to be happening but here we are and i'm i'm grateful for it yeah mm. can i talking about education and where you're at i read your book a few years ago when it released um something you once knew and I read it again recently and just read it everyone this is <laughs> so good but can you tell the story of what happened in the laundrette because I swear it's like my Roman empire right <laughs> <laughs> I can't not think about it it's just yeah tell the story and then everyone will get why um I love I love that I've created well I don't know <laughs> if I love I've created a Roman empire but you know yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. um so yeah dropped out of school with nothing you know six, mm. six GCSEs no GCSEs no A levels and dys- I, got, I call it the triple threat. I had dyslexia, I have dyslexia, ADHD, and dyspraxia. So it was just it was a dysfunctional education. I got expelled numerous times, you know, all that kind of stuff. So considering like university, that this wasn't something on my radar. And then when I was about twenty one, I had, I began dabbling in philosophy. Mm-hmm. Just just read it. like I think like a lot of twenty one mm. year olds do. And it connected me to my childhood in a sense that my dad, I grew up around my dad's apologetic, you know, mm. and I grew up in a in a missionary environment. Mm. So one of my one of my old memories is my dad and the local imam uh, playing risk <laughs> with a bottle of diet coke and the Bible and the Quran on the table, mm. and saying, "Let's talk." And they would fight for world domination on the risk board, having these incredible conversations. Christmas is, you know, sitting with my family where the atheists in my family and the theists in my family would debate. And, and that, I realized all that was in me. And I wanted to study philosophy because I wanted to continue those conversations. But I go, on, I go on the website for the university and it says, you have to have at least an A-level in philosophy. Philosophy is one of those subjects that you need some context going mm-hmm. in. Like, you yeah. know, and um, so if you do not have the A-level, you can't apply. Mm. You, you are unqualified to apply. And yeah, I I looked at that blank screen, like nothing filled out. And I just felt that still small voice, as I often, you know, put it of like, 
what's the worst that could happen? So I apply and I honestly forget about it. I, I know that I can't get in. I know that I'm unqualified. And, uh, but I'm living with a few friends before I get married and the, the washing machine breaks. <laughs> You don't want to live any longer than you need to in a house of men without a washing machine. <laughs> so I go to a local laundrette with my, with my then fiance. And uh, I just, we, we go in and I start trying the washing machines. I put a coin in, the two pound coin, and it spills out the other side. Again, again, again. And there's like 20, you know, there's a laundrette, there's loads mm. of them. And every mm. single one, it spills out mm. until this final, it slots in. So we start the cycle. It's like two hours and we sit down, my, my fiance and I, we're broke <laughs> and we're just planning the honeymoon that we can't afford mm -hmm. and just kind of in our own little world. And then, and this sounds like a joke set up, a Buddhist monk walks in. So this, this man walks in adorned in orange robes with two baskets of orange and crimson and starts putting his coin in the washing machine. So I say, I look, then none of them work apart from the one I'm using. <laughs> so you can either come back in a couple hours or you can sit with us. He puts down his, down his baskets and he, he sits in front of us. And um, I make the astute observation and I say, so you're a Buddhist? And he says, well done. <laughs> and we start talking about Buddhism. And I'm just genuinely curious about it. You know, I, I don't know much about Buddhism, so I'm asking mm. him about it. And he's clearly incredibly knowledgeable. And um, I start telling him that I'm a follower of Jesus and I, I grew up in Pakistan and mm. I know a little bit about Islam and I've really appreciated being in that community. And we start talking about different faiths and get, get onto philosophy. Two hours goes by, as you guys know, when you're talking about the good stuff. And at the end of the conversation, he says, it's interesting to meet someone your age so fascinated with the subject. <laughs> have you ever thought about studying it? And I said, I have, but I'm fiercely unqualified. And he said, where did you, where did you apply? And I tell him, and he says, well, that's interesting because I'm the head of philosophy. <laughs> and um, two weeks later, I get, I get a call from UCAS and I have an unconditional offer wow. to study. And uh, so my, my disconnection with those two words I've used is like um, unqualified and unconditional. Mm -hmm. Like uh, our entry into the world has nothing to do upon our qualifications, has everything to do upon this unconditional grace and love that God offers us. And that seems to open doors that no man can close. And um, yeah, so, wow, so I, 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 have a, I have a photo yeah. of him that I got recently. I was back in the city and I, I bumped into, we took a photo and I said, you don't know how much you changed my life because those four years were so mm, formative. Mm, and mm. it just, it, it wasn't just about learning philosophy. It was about mm. living in the grace mm. yeah. of being unqualified, you know? Mm. Mm. Oh, I, yeah. what, what a brilliant story. Um, as you say, could be the setup for a joke as well, but it was yeah. just phenomenal. I mean, coming back to the writing and poetry, we, we had uh, Paul Kingsnorth mm. uh, on our first season of this podcast. And one of the things he said is that writers are just people who can't not write. Um, mm. I don't know if that feels true for you at all. Yes, yeah, that's beautifully put. Yeah. How would you define yeah. like being a writer? What is it? Mm. What, what's happening when you're kind of putting pen to paper? The yeah. words are starting to kind of form in your mind. Yeah, that's be it's beautifully put. Um, I, 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 I say to my wife quite often, like, I don't know how I am, who I am, or where I am until I've written. Mm. So I, you know, other people can articulate, you know, the answers to those questions. I just can't. Like, I've got, it's got to have, I've got this objective relationship mm. with the page mm. to get there. Writing's a difficult thing to talk about. Mm. Because even if you say you've written a book and someone says, what's the book about? You should be able to offer this, like, quick you know, yeah. summary of it, mm. but it's all in, it's all in the words. Mm. Like mm. that excerpt that I just read you, mm. I could say he's writing about unbelief, but actually it's in the relationship mm. between the vows and, you know, mm. I, I would succinctly say to be a writer is to be a witness mm. that all writing, all good writing, I would say is paying attention. And, um, the discipline of being a writer is the discipline of being a witness. Mm. And so, you know, I would say writer's block begins when the listening ends. My favorite writer, I, will, I could confidently say I think my favorite writer is Frederick Buechner. Right. Um, he would be a great guest on here if he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And Buechner said, um, simply, you know, if you want to write well, pay attention to your life. Mm -hmm. And you'll find then that you're thinking less about writing, you know, you're, and you're more just falling in love with your mm -hmm. existence. And when, it time, when it's time to put pen to page, it just, it just spills out. So to be a writer is to be a, yeah, be a witness. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. I've been thinking about the theology of attention a lot recently, mm. both because I've been thinking about like Simone Veils, where she says she's the French philosopher and she says that to give attention to a sufferer mm. is, is, is 
a type of miracle. Mm. Someone who's suffering, to give them your attention is a type of miracle. And so I was kind of pondering that. And then also mm. on this season, we've chatted to Elizabeth Oldfield. So I read her book um, in preparation for that. And she had this beautiful line just like a throwaway line, but it challenged me so much, which she talks about a day is made gray by my inattention. Mm. And I was like, oh, that is so good. So there's a real, do you think that paying attention is like a spiritual, it's oh a spiritual goodness. practice? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost all spirituality is paying attention. It's, yeah. it's kind of, there's a, in the, I'll just think about this now in the great divorce, there's that moment where, um, the two theologians have got mm. off the bus. And Tony hasn't, hasn't read the mm -hmm. book. I'm, I won't be, bring up, give all the context, <laughs> but they, they, they're about to have the opportunity to meet Christ. And mm. they're in this moment where all they need to do is acknowledge that they have to acknowledge what's within them that might prohibit them. Mm. And uh, one of the theologians says, I, I've got to leave. Like, I've got to go back. And his friend says, why? And he goes, well, tonight I'm doing a lecture on the resurrection. <laughs> and uh, he would, you know, he'd rather go back and yeah. rather than pay attention to what's actually happening. And just thinking about it now, I'm like, you know, Abraham entertains angels that he doesn't know he's entertaining. Isaac's life is saved with a goat in a bush. Mm -hmm. Jacob sleeps on a rock and the ladder from heaven, you know, Joseph has visions in prison. Moses talks to a mm -hmm. bush. It's like the whole arc is like God is embedded in the normal scene yeah. of our lives. And um, that's probably the great spiritual deficiency yeah. right now is, you know, where is he? The, the, the cynic says, where is your God? And the mystic replies, where isn't he? You know? Right. Yeah. I, I guess the, the, the problem is it's harder and harder to pay attention yes. in today's world, isn't it? Because yes. we, we basically live in a world where we're constantly being distracted mm -hmm. by technology primarily these days. So yeah. I don't know, what would it take for us to kind of learn again how to just pay attention? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think learn again is a good phrase because there's nothing, there's not, there's no new route. Mm. It's the, it's the ancient parts of, uh, there's that Dallas Willard line, which has been so popular now, mm. ruthlessly eliminate hurry, but mm. ruthlessly eliminate mm. distraction, mm. ruthlessly pursue boredom, you know, <laughs> ruthlessly pursue limitation, Yeah. ruthlessly, you know, um, I had a little panic on the way here because I couldn't, I have email on my phone. And I, so I had to message my manager to message you to say, I'm going to be late. And I thought to myself, oh, Josh, is it, should I just do it now? Like, have you had right. enough reasons to right. put email on your phone or socials on your phone? But I need to be on that tube right. paying attention. Right. Mm. I, need, I, I need to have as few exit points from my own life, you know? Mm. And the great mm. lie is that your life exists in your email, you know? Yeah. Your life exists next to the strangers next mm. to you. Your life exists you know, in, in the kind of the walk that you do, do every day. And I, I got a three-year-old and already I'm having to try and form her as someone yeah. who has a relationship with boredom, like already. It's I like, mean, just imagine if when you'd gone into that laundrette, you were just on your phone right. and you hadn't noticed the monk. It's like, how exactly. different would your life be? You know? uh, ab uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Like Paul prays, may the eyes of my heart be enlightened. Yeah. You know, that's such yeah. a beautiful prayer of like, may I see, you know, what is on, let me see what is unseen, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not like, let me see the angels descending and ascending from this mm. mystical ladder. Mm. Like, let me see the angels sat in front of me right mm. now. Mm. Like that, that phrase of like, you will entertain angels without mm. knowing it. I was reading Matthew this week of like, and you'll come to me and say, Lord, Lord, when did we feed you? You know, mm. like we were on the train yesterday and as a gentleman, every time we get on this train back to our house, he walks down, up and down, you know, asking for money. And we've got to know him. Mm. And yesterday my, you know, my, my, my wife goes, Richard, just come and sit with us. <laughs> and Richard comes and sits with us next to me and my daughter and my son and my wife. And, um, and he, Richard goes, what have you been doing today? And we said, we've just come back from church. And he goes, ah, you know, he's got this thick Irish accent. I can't do it. He goes, ah, you know, I, uh, maybe I should go back there sometime. I said, Richard, you'd be so welcome to come with us. And he goes, you know what? I'm not ready. <laughs> and then he just tells us about the most horrific traumas, you know, mm -hmm. inflicted by through, you know, the church. And I just, you know, I, I got off the, and it's just like, I'm not, that's the, I believe that's the moment Christ is talking mm, about. Like, mm, mm. you know, it won't be as grand as we think. It, hey, I just want to say to, to my wife, Kara, not to me, mm -hmm. she initiated. Thank you for sharing that conversation with me on the train, you know? Yeah. Or there's, a, there's, a, there's an incredible short story by um, Tolstoy about a, a cobbler. I'll, I'll try and do this quickly. Yeah, yeah. And, and the cobbler is, has lost everything. He's lost his wife and his children to sickness. And um, one night he's reading 
I think he's reading Luke, and it's, it's a similar passage, and he, and he hears in a dream um, the voice that says, he goes to sleep reading. The, the Bible falls on his chest, he fall, and he falls asleep, and he hears a voice in the night, and it says, um, tomorrow I'm coming to visit. And so he wakes up, and he's like, tomorrow he's coming to visit. And so he, every, every kind of minute of his day at this workshop, he's looking out for this visitor. And of course, he notices you know, the old man who's sweeping mm. the street and he mm. leans against his door because he's so, you know, cold and mm. weary and he offers him, you know, brings him in for, uh, for supper. And then the woman whose child, at, at, you know, at her breast and he brings her in for soup. And then the woman who's chasing the boy down the street because he's stolen an apple and he brings reconciliation to them. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 the ending is, is he meets Christ and he, he, he hears Christ in the shadow of his little home and he, he's preparing himself for Christ to step out of the shadows and each person from his day steps mm -hmm. out. Mm. And it's just this, like, I call it a holy inconvenience, <laughs> you know? I love it. Like, mm. leave enough leftovers for the angels. Yeah. They might come knocking. That's great. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me as well. I think one of my, like, most frequent sort of prayers, you know, and... um Jacob, isn't it, where he said he wrestles with God and then yeah. the next morning he's like, surely God was here, but I was unaware of yeah. it. And that's become like one of my biggest fears. Yeah. That I would end a day and be like, I bet you were in that God, but I just, yeah. I was unaware of yeah. it. I, did, I didn't see, yeah. I, I didn't see, I missed you. Yeah. Um, all of this brings us perfectly onto this is the main event, yeah. which I don't know how to sum up what it is. Essays, but there's a podcast and it's I have no become idea what yours. it is. It's, it's huge. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> like, so this is the main event. Just, just follow you on Instagram and you'll see it everywhere. Yeah. That's what you want. But it seems to have really captured something, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like it's put language, I think, to some of these things that we're thrashing mm -hmm. out now that mm -hmm. just on, in the humdrum of life, yeah. we don't realize that God was somewhere and we were unaware yeah, of it, yeah, I think. Yes. Um, but can you just tell us firstly, before we get into sort of what it is, what is it? What cultural um, phenomenon are you speaking in defiance of with those very precise words? This mm. is the main event. Yeah. So, uh, man, I'm a, I'm a distracted person. You know, I got, I've, I'm as ADHD, like mm. I'm moving in a bunch of different directions all of the time. My mind is busy. I have succumbed to all of the things we're talking about in terms of like the cultural pulls and distractions. Yeah, yeah. And I just found myself, it was from going on tour over and over again and being the support act. And going to shows and hearing a support act. And the, the kind of question is, you're like, when does the main event start? Like, <laughs> you know, and thinking of how that sense had like embedded itself into my life of like, when, when are we getting started here? Mm -hmm. And I, I just began saying it fairly flippantly, you know, for years of this is the main event in moments of either like incredible mundane experiences of being in the queue for too long or being like in being in the hospital hallway with a you know a family that have found out their child isn't going to survive. Mm -hmm. This is the main this is the main event, if I can put it really bluntly, is an invitation into suffering. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation into like the truth of your life. Because it's all suffering. All the moments we want to escape are moments mm -hmm. of suffering, whether it's a cue that's too long, or whether it's a diagnosis that we can't believe is actually upon us. We want to escape it somehow, mm -hmm. but there's nowhere to go. There's just distraction. Mm -hmm. So to say this is the main event is to say, this is the life that, you're, that you have. This is the only life that you're going to have. And everything that you desire, everything that you long for, everything that you want to find in your escape is hidden within it. The life you long for is hidden in the life you have. Mm -hmm. So I've been saying it for a long time, just in, you know, in my, in my household, with my mm -hmm. wife, as a mantra for myself. And then one day I just wrote it and it's, you know, I put it on Instagram and the response was like, I mean, the response has been profound mm -hmm. because it's such a simple, ordinary phrase. And yet the messages that I get, especially when I write about it, is some of the most horrific experiences wow. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it literally, I, mean, I got one recently of a father whose son was in hospital in an operation that he wasn't sure if he would survive. And he kept saying, this is the main event. Not to say this is the best moment of my life, but I am refusing to try and escape from this suffering to only then fall into another type of suffering, mm -hmm. which I can't glean anything of mm -hmm. God from. Mm -hmm. If I choose to embrace this suffering, I can meet the God who comforts me in it. This is the main event. This is my life. Mm -hmm. This is my lot. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. it. You know, and, and yeah, it's been, it's been really beautiful to see how it's, it's resonated. It's, it's an incredible message. And I think... Today, there are so many people, it's been true, I suppose, of all human history, but who 
kind of assume, yeah, that that the thing they're working towards is something in some grand prize in the yeah. future. And uh, there's that old story, isn't there? Of you, you can spend your whole life climbing the ladder only to find it's been leaning up against the wrong wall. Yeah, and yeah. and I just feel like that's what we need right now is for people to realise actually that kind of quest for some amazing kind of goal yeah, yeah. It, it's always actually an illusion because yeah. actually it's right here in front of you yes. and the life that you've been given right now is where you'll find the gift yes um but it's it's very easy to be kind of well distracted by the messages of the world to say yeah it's always just over the horizon yeah. and once you've got this that the other thing the yes. perfect relationship the, yes. the job you've always wanted mm. whatever yeah that's the moment at which you'll discover yeah that absolutely and a part of the, I think a part of the reason it's so hard is because it's you and you alone. Mm. Um, I love this. There's this uh, line by Blaise Pascal who says, um, all human suffering could be defined by man's inability to be alone with himself. Mm. And if we, if we want freedom for any things you're talking about, mm. it's, it's that. It's when were you last on your own? You know, mm -hmm. like when, and what does it feel like to be on your own? What does it feel like to be in your own company? Uh, who you are when no one's watching is who you really are. Like that thought has haunted me. Mm -hmm. Who you are when mm -hmm. no one's watching, mm -hmm. that's who you are. And and to 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 grow this relationship with yourself is a really like Frederick Beekner says, um, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes, but love yourself as you love your neighbor. You know, mm -hmm. it's like can can you give yourself mercy? Can you give yourself compassion? Can you call yourself to attention? Like can you be fully alive when you're fully alone mm. and and i think we've all met people who can and it's those people that aren't trying to escape anywhere it's like <laughs> where are you gonna run there's nowhere to run you don't need to run anymore mm. that like anxious presence isn't ruling your life yeah. it's i'm here and i'm grateful to be here and mm. this is who i am and my, my my offering to the lord can can i quote some of one of your essays yeah. woe to the influencers who peddle the lie that a last minute trip to bali could offer you something more fulfilling than attending to an aging parent, failing business, or changing your child's wet sheets for the third time that week. The life you long for is hidden in the life you have. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's it, I suppose. It's, it's that idea that these things are just sort of the things we need to kind of yeah. get past, yeah. you know, put in the back, you know, solve. Yeah, yeah. Get through, and then yeah. we'll, we'll get to the thing that we're really meant to, yeah. to live for. And, yeah. and it's just not true. This is it. it. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is it. And I, I don't know, I don't know if I want to be, I don't know if I want to meet the man that I would be if I was, you know, running from those moments. Like when I tally it up over time, like you, you guys know this so well, when you sit with someone and their words sound expensive, like mm. everything they say just feels like it's got some weight to it. It's not like a, an Instagram caption of like pseudo wisdom that they haven't paid for. It's cost them something. Yeah. And that is that you know when marilyn robinson talked about the 24 year gap you know of just like hmm. i was living i was living gilead between like, her first and yeah, second novel. yeah yeah sorry yeah, yeah, yeah i was yeah, living it yeah. like i was embodied it so when you turn the tap on mm. you start writing gilead which is potentially one of the most densely like rich wisdom parable books mm. i've read mm. It's all there. The 24 years have shaped mm, it. Mm, and how present mm, have you been to these mm, nuances of yeah. your life? I want to become that man. Like that's, you know, I've got my eyes set on him, which means, uh, you know, I've got a, can I give you one real quick yeah, thing? Yeah, please. Um, I, I've been living in London since July. My grandma lives in London and I just have felt so aware that I haven't called her. Mm. I, I, I've called her. I just haven't spent the time with her that I wanted to spend. My, my, my grandfather is my, my hero. He, he died 20 years ago last week, but he, 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 th my, my love of writing is from this man. He was a thespian in, in the body of a banker. And uh, so whenever he'd gather the family, would get around a table, he'd raise his glass to make a toast. And I've realized everything I do as a poet and when, you know, when I preach or speak, I want to emulate that moment. He raised his mm -hmm. glass and he gathered us and he brought us together. And what, what I experienced as a child in that moment is really ultimately what I want to provide for someone else to experience. Um, anyway, so I got a long way around, I'm sorry. Uh, but he, um, it was 20 years um, since he died. And the last toast he did to us as a family was at Christmas. And he quoted the play Dear Octopus by Dodie Smith. <laughs> the last you know, stanza he says uh, to the family, that dear octopus whose tentacles we never quite escape from nor in our innermost being ever quite hope to. 
So I'm on the tube last week and I see the play is happening at South Bank. I'm like, this is it. Like, I, I'm going to call my grandma. I'm going to take her. So I call her and um, on, on the 20th anniversary, and I said, I'd love to take you to, to Dear Octopus. We shared this really beautiful moment. And she just says, it's been 20 years, darling. And it just opened up the space for me just to pour into her and just honor her. I'm like, mm. You've lived these 20 years so well. Mm. And um, literally the next day she goes into hospital and um, she's been in hospital for a week mm. now. And, you know, I'm, I'm checking messages. I'm, ho hopefully she's going to pull mm. through, but mm. she's in a very vulnerable state. So she won't be able to come with me this week. Mm. And I just thought, my goodness, like, I'm so glad I, I called her, but mm. I so nearly didn't. Yeah. Mm. And I, you know, like, and I know it's kind of cliche, but this is it. Yeah. You know, there's nothing I'm doing in my life where, in writing or performing that eclipses that. Like, it's all mm. about that. Mm -hmm. If I'm just a sounding drum to remind people of that, <laughs> then I'm, I'm happy with that, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. I love it. If you enjoy listening to Reenchanting, then you'll probably enjoy our other two podcasts from Seen and Unseen. Seen and Unseen Aloud is a weekly dose of commentary on culture, trends, and current affairs. Godpod is a deeper dive into theology and faith, hosted by Graham Tomlin, Jane Williams, and Michael Lloyd. You can find them wherever you get your podcasts from. But now, back to today's episode of Reenchanting. Being that type of person, being someone who doesn't escape from the suffering, who, you know, someone who ruthlessly ruthlessly eliminates distraction and things. Again, I keep bringing her up. Sorry, Elizabeth. We were talking to Elizabeth Oldfield and she said, you know, she wants to be the type of person that you would want at the end of the world. And I'm- uh, Yeah, my goodness, that essay. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My days. Oh, it's <laughs> so good. And I keep thinking about, is it Mark Sayers who keeps talking about non-anxious presence? Yeah. Like by doing these things, by kind of the spiritual practice of saying, this is the main event. Mm -hmm. We will like. I think the world is craving people who are those things, who are non-anxious presence, not because they've distracted themselves from all the things that may give them anxiety, but because they've kind of centered themselves in it. Have you found that sort of a, yeah, a craving for those people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, just to bring it to like real time. I, I returned from a trip to Nigeria two days ago, mm. and I was there for the sole purpose of meeting our persecuted brothers and sisters. Wow. And um, I mean, immensely honored to go because I went as a poet. I went mm -hmm. to, to tell their stories. And I met pe person after person who has had no opportunity to escape their suffering. Mm. Mm. No opportunity to run from it. And I'm talking about the most horrendous suffering. And uh, there was a widow that I met whose, whose husband was murdered last year. Um, a Boko Haram attack and um, we walk into her house. She just had a ha house rebuilt and uh, we go in, she has her five children there and we're there for maybe five minutes before she's on her knees worshiping. Wow. This wasn't like, Hey, let's get out of the guitar and have a worship time. <laughs> her response to yeah. five minutes of our conversation was just to glorify God. Wow. And she's singing this f refrain over and over, which is all I have is Jesus. All I have is Jesus. I am not afraid and I am not ashamed. And she's just singing it over and over and over. And, um, you know, this is, I'm, I'm talking about what we're talking about on a very like intense mm -hmm. scale, mm -hmm. but the inability to escape suffering in her life had driven her to this spiritual depth wow. that was saintly. Like, mm -hmm. you, do you know what I mean? And I sort of think, okay, so I, now I'm back here. Like, I'm, you, you know, it's culture shock. You can be yeah. there for six days. It's culture shock. Yeah. I got on the tube from Heathrow and I'm on the Piccadilly line and I'm weeping on the Piccadilly line. I just put on this, a songwriter that I love and I'm just weeping and I'm trying to like, it's packed. And I can see the guy opposite me. There's a guy like tradesman just paint all over his overalls and he's looking at me and he just nods, you know, just, just like, I don't know what it is. Mm. Just nods. And I just nod at him and I'm just seeing all the images of all the mm. people I've met. And, um, and I think, okay, this has reinstilled everything I'm talking about. I don't have the threat that they have. But if I want to be someone, if I want to be someone who's got something to offer my children's children, then I have to avoid the desire to escape suffering. I have to be able to hold my baby in the middle of the night who's screaming over and over again and do something with it. Like, mm. I've got to do something with it. Mm. It can't just be like something I'm running from, mm. you know? Mm. And if she is my example, her name is, her name is Nambam she's my example, then really what I've got set, whatever is set, whatever suffering I'm going to go through through the rest of my life, 
she's now really my my guide because mm. mm. I don't think I'm ever going to experience what she has, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, say culture shock. In a way, I, th I think a lot of your experiences kind of having grown up on the mission field and that yeah. kind of thing with your parents, it obviously all informs. And I guess being able to see the way in which we often get a very, I think, if you like, myopic version of Christianity in the West. We sort mm. of, we kind of see our own problems and divisions yeah. and specific cultural issues. You, you only have to travel a bit to see that actually it's much bigger <laughs> than what we have. Yeah. What's, what's that experience been like as you've kind of witnessed sort of the bigger picture, if you like, the yeah. way that you've seen just that amazing story there of, of the way Christianity kind of the living faith, if you like, yeah. of people as you, as you go around? Yeah, well, yeah, the living faith. I think I've, that's, that's, that's very well put. I feel like I have the luxury of having a dormant faith. <laughs> we all do. Like, I think I have a luxury of like Jesus being an add-on <laughs> to all of this. And, and per perhaps even like an intellectual and sometimes, you know, emotional uh, theme park. Like I can just have fun here, you know. Right. And, for, and for these people, it's, this is all I have. And eternity with them is so close. Yeah. It's so close. And I'm sat with this bishop who's living in a house, a normal sized house, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, he has 60 children in that house. He's converted floor to ceiling into bunk beds. Like I'm talking like four or five beds yeah. because he said, you know, Boko Haram might orphan them, but mm -hmm. they will become my children. You know, he goes into the villages and takes them. And I said to him, you know, your house has been surrounded by gunmen. Your house has been bombed. What about, why don't you get out? You know, like you, you, you're a retired bishop now. Like you've got options. Like, why don't you get out? And as I'm asking him this question, he's just smiling at me the whole time. And, um, and, he, and, and then I say, because you, you know, you have children, like you have responsibilities and he's smiling and, and what would happen to your children? And he's smiling and he says, look what happened to these children. God provided them a home. God provided them a meal. God provided them a father he'll do the same with mine you know it's this sense of like he like i am to live as christ to die's game on such a visceral level mm -hmm. that i can't fully comprehend it you know and he said that, i'll quote him verbatim because i wrote it down as he said he said son the aim of my life isn't to achieve safety but satisfaction in the lord <laughs> the aim of my life isn't to achieve safety and uh and that has like rocked me. I'm I'm 40 hours away from that conversation, so I haven't done the time to fully process yeah. it. But yeah, so much of my life has been about safety, about you know that kind of secular idea of paradise. How can I create paradise here yeah. and now? How yeah. can we do it? How can we mm -hmm. make our stages bigger? How can we make our houses larger? How can we make our bank accounts fuller? You know, like mm -hmm. how can we do it? And if you kind of spend it any time on Instagram, that is the cultural narrative of like yeah. the guru of the day is like I can help you get rich like i can help you become successful you know and they're looking at me like josh we could we could be in eden tomorrow like we are we have no time to build a paradise we mm. we could be gone tomorrow like the veil <laughs> is so thin you know so the, the phrase i've written in my notebook here mm. is um may i may i keep eternity in my gaze and i don't know what that means but that's just something that's in my yeah. mind right now we're passing through yeah, here, yeah. you know, like, mm. yeah. Yeah, I've been chatting. So I've been doing some work with um, Christians from Iran. Mm. And uh, I remember I was chatting to one and she had this most nuts story. And he, I was like, what's your prayer for Iran? Like, mm. like, what do you want us to pray for you? Mm. And it wasn't that the persecution would stop. And so I asked, I was like, I thought it would be that the, you would stop being persecuted for being a Christian in Iran. And she kind of almost told me off. She was like, the church is growing. Like the yeah. church is growing. People are becoming Christians yes. more like the numbers are unimaginable every day. Why would I pray yeah. Yeah. for the persecution? To, I was yeah. like, what? Yeah. I mean, you yes. say you're 40 hours away from that conversation. I think conversations like that will take us a lifetime. Oh, absolutely. A life. I and then to distill it into your life. So I'd, I'd think of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Yes. And, and okay. So this brings us into this kind of relationship to suffering of like, mm. all right, so in any way that you can today lean into suffering, then then do it. Like there's a blessing in this that they've seen that we haven't seen yeah. yet, like mm. in our comfortability mm. and in our safety, like lean into it. Mm. Ah. It, it, it does feel like that, that I remember there's a, 
an old al- album or song called Kingdom of Comfort. And the, it feels like that's what we're building a lot of the time, mm. uh, a kingdom of comfort. And it's very easy to kind of mistake, as you say, that as somehow the goal, yeah. you know. Um, and yet it, it appears that Christianity has, at its most tangible often when it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, so what, I don't know, what, how do we, I, I mean, we, we call this program Reenchanting and it's because we, we want to, you know, champion the idea of reenchanting yeah, uh, a sort of disenchanted world. But I often feel like we're so, um, we've built ourselves these walls to kind of basically stop us ever having to really, really face death mm. or suffering or, you know, all, all the things that are actually the things that often bring you closest to god yeah. in the sense to to the reality of of this being an enchanted world so i guess in our distracted comfortable existence where we often hold everything at, at arm's length how do we how in this context can we kind of bring that sense you had in that you know house in nigeria to to this place i suppose yeah that's such a good question oh um what what i've what I'm gleaning from them, what I'm learning in this is Christ is a, Christ is a very real bomb. Mm-hmm. And why do I distract myself? It is, it is to numb the pain mm-hmm. rather than actually heal the pain. Mm-hmm. And so does, does the modern believer, does the Western believer truly experience Christ as a bomb to their suffering? Or do they have no need for a bomb because they're anethnotized? They're, the pain isn't there because it's just, you can't feel it. So I, I, I almost feel like there's a, there's a duty and obligation, a mandate for the, for the modern believer to viscerally feel the pain and find Christ as their balm to offer anything to the world. You know, it's where, where have you gone with your suffering? I've gone into the presence of the only one who can hold me and, and heal me in it. And that is in this life, you will have troubles, you know, mm. uh, but fear not, I've overcome the world. Ble- I, I think it's so profound that the second line of this incredible speech is, blessed are those who mourn. And I, and I like to think of him just lingering there. Blessed are those who mourn. Like you're almost as a poet feeling the weight of that sequence mm. of words. Let me say again, blessed are those who mourn. Last year, I, I stood up at a memorial for a young man that was murdered in Brixton. And um, his father invited me as a poet just to come and share. And I just stood up there. Blessed are those who mourn. This is the blessing no one wants to receive. Mm. And yet when it's time to receive, we're so grateful that it's been given. Mm. Blessed are those who mourn. And then we lean in. Why is there a blessing? Why? How mm. could there be a blessing? Mm. Mm. But they shall be comforted. And it's like it speaks to the deepest ache. of Like all you actually have ever wanted is to be comforted. And so all these pseudo experience comfort find themselves vacant and find themselves wanting in the presence of god do do is that real i look at nambam or i look at bishop jacob in nigeria and i'm like they have found that his his presence is a bomb and and every single one of them said the same thing to me as i left like either grabbing my shoulders or in or in an embrace don't let go of him Mm. don't let go of him and i've i've been you know I've, i've i've studied philosophy i've been through the Whatever word you want to give it, the deconstruction of like, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've asked these questions. I've, I've poked this bear, you know, and um, to quote uh, Elliot, T.S. Eliot and, and the little Gidding, you know, we will not cease our exploration, but we will arrive where we first started and know it for the first time. Mm-hmm. So now I'm realizing what's the best thing I have to offer my, this culture, like this society, what do I have? And I have the, the radical story of Christ's death and his resurrection. But the more that I experience that story in the mundane nature of my life and inhabit it, the more I experience it in my suffering, the more I know my eyes are alive as I tell it and my heart is pouring out. As You know, like it's not about the words. It's about mm-hmm. the well from where the mm-hmm. words come. That kind of makes a difference. I, I was, I'll, I'll, I'll close it just moment. I was sat with a friend recently. She's the coolest person I know. She's like, runs this, she's a part of this incredible music collective here in, in London. She's amazing. She's the exact kind of person that I want to find the best, most creative way of sharing the gospel with, right? Mm. And she literally says to me, like, I don't know, like straight out of the New Testament, Nicodemus or something. She goes, so what must I do? Like, how, how, how do I get this then, Josh? How do I get saved? And I run through all of the most creative lines that I have. <laughs> And I said to her, 
I think you need to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus. And you know what she goes? She goes, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Like there is something in her that just wants to surrender. Like doesn't want like a new way to be her best self. Like <laughs> wants to surrender. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I had that T.S. Eliot line um, in my mind as you were reading the exit. Yeah. This idea of coming back to something yeah. that was already there, yeah. not finding something new. Yeah. Um, surrender, you're good at this because that just happens to be <laughs> <laughs> uh, the name of one of your singles. Do you want to... So the album is liberated. Yeah. You've got two... Is it two singles out at the moment? Yeah. yeah uh, Serenity yeah. and Surrender. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is huge and really we need to get you back for a whole hour of Liberated, but can you tell us the story behind Surrender in particular? Yeah, the, the, the album comes from like, I want to be free, I want to be liberated. Mm -hmm. um, it comes from having a son and realizing, just get faced, I know you got a, you got a boy. Yeah. You know, just being faced with yourself in a new way, realizing you're bringing another man into the world and, and, and just feeling like there's a lot of stuff I haven't dealt with. There's some stuff I need healing from. And um, I started the, a recovery journey, 12-step recovery journey. Honestly, there's the Ronald Rollizer Ryle, phrase of pain that isn't uh, transformed is transferred. Mm. And um, that led yeah. me to like, okay, I need to process some of this. Stuff. I, don't wanna, oh, I don't want him to in, inhabit this. Mm. And um, throughout that process, these songs were written. And Surrender, Surrender came from a recovery meeting. I was sat in this recovery meeting um, and you don't never know really what people believe in the 12 steps. There's a mm -hmm. sense of God and higher power. But I, you know, I was just quite blunt with it. And I had this, this sense of like, I realized I've been running. And I, I, I was talking about Jacob of like, Jacob, J, Jacob ran until he ran out of road, you know, like mm -hmm. he's on the riverbank and, and it's like his brother's caught up with him and he's, he's his deceptor and a thief. And I felt like that. Like we talk about our shadows or however you want to position, I can identify with this this hustler, you know, that, that finally God had got hold of. And there was just something in this feeling of like Jacob, you know, I'm sure everyone knows the story, but Jacob had deceived his father out of, you know, giving his older brother the birthright. Mm. So he'd, he had this blessing his whole life that mm. wasn't his. Mm. And when he's face to face with God, what does he ask for? A blessing. Mm. And the blessing is in the posture of surrender like the blessing is in this posture of being pinned down and the blessing he wants isn't affluence and it's not influence the blessing that he wants is intimacy is to be known and, and so the blessing he's given is a new name and so right surrenders this song of like i give up you know like there's two ways to a blessing through deception or through a wrestle and i want to <laughs> i want to wrestle with the god with god so that my, my, my people in 12 step that my recovery group have been my discipleship group and have been incredible. And I've learned a lot in that process. And a lot of this album is about liberation and limitation. So I feel like it's very personal, but it's universal as well. It's a lot of what we're talking about, like liberation isn't getting what you want. And when you want it, Nam Bam, the woman I met, mm. you know, to throw your, throw yourself on the floor and worship in front of some strangers. I'm like, you're yeah. free. Yeah. Wow. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, when it comes to the creative process then of doing that, of putting your own story and journey yes, and all, all those things you're kind of picking up and, uh, you know, this, this deep sense of this being the main event into the music. How, how does that hit people when they are listening to something? Uh, what, what is it about the way that you can tell that story in the way that you tell it, you know, through hip hop, rap, poetry, mm. whatever that, that sort of, helps per, uh, someone to kind of step into that yeah. reality because i just feel like there's for me one of the things that's most enchanting mm. about our world is that somehow music art literature poetry they just yeah they steal past the kind of yeah. the rational yeah. defenses if you like that people have and somehow they they can enter into something in a, yeah. in a different way so what's what's going on there and, and how how is it that just i don't know the perfect way of capturing that in a in a phrase or a line yeah. kind of does that for yeah someone. that's a great question yeah i mean i found hip-hop at like 13 and i'm a i'm a white kid in england listening to music coming out of bronx mm. it's so it's just storytelling mm. and it's such an, a different story to what i've ever lived and yet i was enamored by it mm. and what am i being enamored by is someone's confession of their life it's so different to my life but my only response is then to write about my life 
And so I, I find like in the, in the music that most deeply resonates with me is this confession of I was here and this is the life I was living in. And so I've tried to be confessional in my music. I just can't write any other way. Mm. I, I'm, I'm just not the guy to write the big like pop hit, you know, I'm just not that guy. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm writing confessional music because it's the relief valve for me. And yet, and I find it's the most resonating form of like connection with others. And to, just, to, just to go a little bit more, maybe mm. abstract, the, the Genesis story is go into the world and name, mm. name the animals, like bring language. Mm. And so for the writer, for me as the poet, it's n name some things, yeah. name what needs to be named. And the more particular I am, it appears the more universal it becomes. The more, the more I name it, more, the more particular I name it, the more resonance it has. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I wrote a song on, on my first album um, about my, my mother and the depression that she experienced throughout mm -hmm. her life. And um, that song is just connected with so many people and not mm -hmm. because their mother was depressed necessarily, mm -hmm. but because there was some confession that they needed yeah. to hear. And it just, so uh, yeah, I, I think I, we're desperate for the unsayable to be said, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're desperate mm -hmm. for that. And um, I just can't write any other way. So it's not a great answer, but I, I find like if I'm listening to a song, I'm listening for the moment that I can grab hold of the scene, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I want to, I want to be able to picture the moments. So you can be talking about, you know, your desire for world peace. You could be talking about the most, you know, the most biggest concept, like, but bring me into, I don't know, the Tesco express on the fourth aisle you know, buying potatoes where that thought was planted. Mm. And then, then, then I'm in, you know, mm. yeah, so yeah. to become particular is to become universal, mm. like in, in your writing. Yeah. What you're, what you're so great at as well is this fusion of like, here's some spiritual thoughts, but actually they, they, they're just human thoughts. Yes. Or, you know, here's some Christian language, but actually it's just our heart language, yeah. isn't it? And here's this and here's that. And so like your music is in no way confined into mm -hmm. like a Christian box. It's based out, it's on Radio 1, it's on Spotify's New Music Friday. Like it's all over the place. Are there, that's, firstly, that's like brave and complex and complicated. So are there voices that have kind of been like your due north where they've gone before you and you're like, I like the way they do that. And you've kind of, gone in their direction a that's little bit that's such a good question i i haven't thought about it in that way there's no one that sticks out of like i'm gonna follow that thread yeah. in the same way perhaps you're describing it there's just integrity and authenticity mm. and do you know what it's it's also in the moments where you find out the artist that you so respect has shares some similar like you know, spiritual heritage yeah, as you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, there was a time, there was quite like a popular thought, like with Christians writing music of like, yo, I'm, I'm undercover, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And for me, it was like, what are you being undercover with? Because if you're being undercover with your life yes, and the foundation of like, how, you know, how you hold everything up in yeah. your life, yeah. um, I feel like you're giving up mm. too much. And as a writer, you know, Paul Gallico talks about um, bleed onto the page. Because that's the point of establishing connection with your reader, mm. but also yourself. Mm. Like you know, so like bring your bring your entirety to this. And I, I'm 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 learning it more. I'm finding my voice more and more. And what I'm loving, like in Surrender, there's a line that says, "Um, raise the bar, I'll drink you beneath it. I throw hands with Jesus. Uh, he hits me where I need it." And it is like. You asked me, what does that line mean? I don't know exactly, but it's something, it's something about, I have some vices yeah. mm. and I have a God who isn't afraid of them. Yeah. And, uh, and that line like is really connected with people in and out of like our faith kind yeah, of world. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I think, I think you're saying something in there, yeah. you know? Yeah. So just, you just, just, you know, write what's true. I, I, mm. I love that about your stuff. And I think that's why people resonate with it because it doesn't feel like I'm just trying to do a Christian Jay-Z or something mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. the, the artist is. It's it because I sadly I think some of the quote unquote Christian kind of music industry, mm -hmm. if you like, there has been that sense of we're gonna create a Christian version of such right. and such, yeah. you know, yeah. well, you know, secular artist. Yeah. And maybe there's a place for that in, in some instances, but it feels like sometimes it's just a kind of a, a bit of a, a a downgraded copy and paste mm -hmm. at Whereas I think w what you're describing about like, let's not try and be these quote unquote undercover, yeah. like I'm just going to sneak some Christian sort of imagery into it. Yeah. Just, just like be yourself. Yeah. And as you say, like bleed onto the page yeah. and people will 
see that, yeah. whether you call yourself a Christian or not, it's yeah. going to come through, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it would be a sad moment in your life when all the people who you were trying to capture get the praise of, you know, then in turn were celebrating the artist who was doing all the things you were avoiding because yeah. they were on it. Mm. And you were like, oh, man, like, what was I doing this whole time? Like, I just missed out on enjoying the authenticity of my voice because I was mm. trying to do it in this, if I can be like, blunt manipulative way yeah it's you know but i think that's the role of an artist in society Mm, is to mm, tell the truth mm, like mm. i think we're here as servants i think we're john the baptist i think we're here like um dressed provocatively sometimes Mm. shouting on the riverbanks he he preached on the river jordan so there's got to be a day that no one was there he was Mm. preaching to the waters and the people started coming and they started listening because i bet he had a or a booming voice yeah. and he's dressed crazy but when they get closer to him they he's preparing a way yeah. for something else that's i feel like the role in that, that's the role of a mm. poet let's just stand up and say words that get people always paul at act 17 yeah. well in the words of your poet yes yeah, yeah. And, you know yeah, like yeah. yeah and and i feel like you know maybe a bit, bit, bit of a stretch but maybe jesus himself when you read some of the things, you know, as they're recorded in the yeah. Gospels, there's a poetic quality to oh the, the beatitude of an obvious yeah. example. Luke 15, yeah. everyone's gathered around. Okay, just succinctly tell us the kingdom, the all in mm. one. Just, yeah. There was a man who had two sons. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, yeah. it's just like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, it is, I was actually speaking to someone who's done a whole book on the genius of Jesus okay. as, a, as a kind of storyteller. And he said, you take that story of the prodigal son, you know, obviously the two sons, and it's almost like it's the most perfectly created story in right. like 350 words or yeah. something. And and you, I think we sometimes skip that, that, that Jesus was a brilliant storyteller, mm. imaginative kind of, yeah. you know, conveyor of yeah. ideas. Yeah. And that's why we're still talking about that. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah also, absolutely. Also, the, the words, like they had rhythm and... So in Aramaic, the Lord's Prayer rhymes. Right. Really? Yeah, so like just the actual way he physically spoke, the words he chose, the rhythm and the cadence and all of that, none of that. Like there was artistry, like mm, pure yeah. artistry wow. in yeah. what Jesus was saying, always. That's brilliant. Yeah. I, I mean, when it comes to that whole area, what do you think? I mean, I, I guess we often look back at mm. a lot of the, the great art and poetry and, you know, of of the last 2000 years and so much of it has obviously been inspired by mm. Christian faith and so on. And people often bemoan the fact that today oh, it just doesn't seem like Christians are producing, yeah. you know, the same sort of thing or it's this sort of slightly knockoff versions yeah. of like stuff. Yeah. What, what's your feeling on that? Do you think, do you think we're due for a re, I don't know, a re-enchantment of, of the Christian story within art, poetry? I think we're in it. I think, I think, I think we're all, the, I think we're all the way in it. Like I, I find myself in, in these moments of hearing artists who, who you know, love Jesus, uh, whether it's that abundantly clear or not, and then artists that absolutely is very abundantly clear. Mm. And I think, man, I, the, the conversations we were having 10 years ago, five years ago aren't relevant anymore. You yeah. know, like this, it's not a relevant conversation to say, I write music, but I'm a Christian, there's nowhere to... I fit. It's like, mm. no, like some of your favorite artists are Christians. Mm. And I would say in the music that is being made that really professes Christ, the art that's being made, the stories that are being written. I mean, I take like a Christian, Christian Wyman. And I think this guy is writing, this guy, this book is loved by, as I said, my favorite writers across the board. Mm. It's, it's like, no, we're, we're like on the leading edge of things in ways that people don't, fully appreciate but perhaps that's exactly how it should be it mm. should have a subversive mm. edge to it mm. where the, the the christian influence isn't the most famous influence but oh my days like it is there you know and mm. and uh and i think that's coming with the maturity of acknowledging god in the best works of art that we have around yeah. us like i'm taking it you know like mm. that glorifies my king you know that that the dedication the craft and we, 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 we've gone past the ear of you know, chopping everything up into whether it's sacred or it's secular, you know, the whole earth is the Lord's and everything therein, you know, mm. there's ladders propped up everywhere. And that's taken a maturing in the church to do that. Of, you know, I remember sitting in the back of the car with Eminem in my headphones, <laughs> blaring out, you know, as he's, he's got the most like, you know, explicit lyrics, my mom turning around and pulling my headphones off. And I was like, why are you listening to this? And 
um, like, and the reason I was listening to it was because it was real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then she gave me some Christian rap and it was terrible. <laughs> That isn't the yeah. case anymore. <laughs> no. right, okay. you, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. and it's not it's not just that Christian rappers have got better. It's just that our appreciation for mm. what an artist is doing, mm. I think, has matured. You know, mm. and I, I mean, a, a whole I don't need to. Yeah. I mean, are there any artists you wouldn't listen to in in the sense that do you think there's kind of a there is a negative kind of art out there, kind of type of hip hop or whatever it is? Yeah, I think um, Abraham. Joshua Herschel talks about sin as the disturbance of shalom mm. in, in, the, in ourselves and in others, causing it within ourselves and causing, mm. and there's, there's art that disturbs my shalom, mm. you know, mm. and, um, and I, I would say it would be sinful right. for me to listen to because it disturbs my peace, engages my thoughts and things that, um, so yeah, like yeah. for sure, I, I, I couldn't be too prescriptive about it. Though. Right. Mm. And and it might not necessarily be that that's the same reaction someone that's else it. has to that. Because I'm to sure I listen to something. That yeah. I know that I listen to something that some right. of my Christian brothers and sisters would say. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's disturbing to me. Yeah. An hour was just never going to be enough. <laughs> we kicked off when I knew that, and we've come to the end. And I was like, oh, I was right. Now oh, was enough. A joy to be yeah. here. What, what's what's on the radar for yeah. you? Um, have you got another album in yeah, the Yeah, so, so, so Liberate, the full album will come out um, at the end of the summer, mm -hmm. which I keep adding to it. It keeps growing. <laughs> I, be, I That's the nice thing, I guess, about living in a, essentially a digital released kind yeah, of world now. Yeah. It's not like that's the, the record and yeah. it's done. It's like a work in progress. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a real, a real joy. Now it'll come out in the summer. I'm bringing out a song called Trust in May, which is... You'll see that you'll see Nigeria, you'll see the trip, mm. Mm. and um, it's like the honor of my lifetime to write that song, and because the, because the people over there have commissioned me to come back and tell their story, so that's gonna wow. come out, and it it will be heartbreaking and it will be like empowering, and this whole main event thing, I'm like, I think there's a mm. book there, so yeah. I'm, I'm 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 diving right. into that, oh, spending right. some time, I'm spending a lot of time writing. Sounds great. Yeah, wow. that is music to my ears. Can you come <laughs> back when that? I'd love to. I'm grateful for what it's you're doing day. here. I'm grateful for this conversation and, and the guests that you've had on. It's, 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 and you're, you're a brilliant host. Oh, thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, God. We, 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 we'll definitely get you back now, Joshua. <laughs> um, no, Bring another book with you next time. Well, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, it's been so good. Thank you so much. Um, and if you're watching and you've enjoyed today's conversation or listening and have enjoyed it, uh, please do get, get hold of more from Reenchanting. You can find us obviously online on the YouTube channel, on the podcast and at the website as well. Yeah, and this podcast is made possible by the support of listeners. So if you want to be one of them, seenandunseen.com forward slash give is where to go. For now, thanks for being with us. See you next time.